membership uh, on all campuses right now. I have an announcement to make, and then I'm going to welcome our guest speaker for the tonight. Um, uh, lots of people have been asking me everywhere I go. My phone has been filling up, and in every hallway, everyone's been asking about my dad because he had uh, knee surgery this week, and everyone's been asking me how he is doing. And uh, bad news, they had to amputate his leg. <laughs> no, just kidding. He's doing all right. We got a picture of him. Uh, check this out. He sends his love. He uh, had a partial knee replacement this past week, and he has been uh, in lots of pain, but he is in really good spirits, and he wanted to pass along to our congregation from him and my mom as well that they are so grateful for the prayers, the breakthrough prayers of our church. They're really sustaining him through this, and he's hoping to return maybe even next weekend if he can get my mom to agree. Uh, so let him, you know how that goes. But uh, we're super excited about our guest who's here with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Ed Stetzer is uh, the senior fellow at the Billy Graham Center down in Wheaton and for many years was uh, the director of research at Lifeway and he is a friend of our pastor. He's an author and a speaker and he's got something I'm really excited about as we continue on this theme of breakthrough prayer. So let's welcome him Harvest as he comes to join us right now. Thank you for the uh, welcome, for showing up. Hopefully that's not all we do today. You got a Bible, take it out. We've got some stuff to cover. We're gonna be looking at Matthew chapter nine. Matthew chapter nine. We're gonna talk about prayer as we continue this series uh, on prayer. So excited tonight, Rolling Meadows, Elgin, Niles. We're gonna look to God's word and we're gonna look together to Matthew chapter nine. Uh, it's good to be here in not just... Uh, speaking here tonight, but also to actually be in Chicago. I've only lived here for about two months now. We just moved here from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, and so excited. Uh, I, I'm a professor at Wheaton College. I run the Billy Graham Center there, and uh, Phil Reichen, the president of Wheaton, uh, was recruiting me. He told me, and I'm so excited. I mean, what a beautiful day. He told me the weather's always like this, so we're excited, excited about that. That's going to be great. And I noticed in the weather it's coming up, it's going to be in the 40s uh, this next week. Uh, but the good news, he's told me it never gets below 40 is what he told me. Or is that it never gets 40 below? I'm not sure which it was. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm excited to be here and to be able to visit and to uh, share God's word today. We're in a series called Breakthrough Prayer. Week one, Pastor James talked about why we don't pray. Week two, biblical prayer builds confidence. Week, th uh, week uh, three was uh, confident prayer builds persistence. Tonight, I want to talk about consistent prayer builds compassion. Consistent prayer builds compassion. I want you to look with me at Matthew chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 35 down to verse 38. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38. Jesus is speaking. Uh, it matters a few things. Hope you have your Bible open and follow along with us. It matters the context because we're going to kind of look through what this actually shows us. Because just before here, we actually have Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount. So we walk through this Sermon on the Mount moment. And in Matthew chapter 10, which is follows, he actually is going to commission his apostles for ministry and mission. But then before he does that, he tells them to pray for something. And as we look at this series on breakthrough prayer, I want us to look at what does he tell them to pray for and why does that matter to us? It says in Matthew chapter 9, beginning at th verse 35, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and, and, and don't miss this, right, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The harvest is plentiful. Jesus then speaks. Then he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray. Therefore pray earnestly. Don't miss that. For the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, some might say that when you're the guest speaker at harvest and you use a passage that uses the word harvest five times, that you're pandering. But I'm actually not. I, I think it's essential that we understand this prayer because this prayer, this consistent prayer, will build compassion in our hearts for those who don't know Christ. Now, why would that matter? Well, because partly because of the context where we are, right? We're between two moments in the Gospel of Matthew. Again, Matthew 5 through 7 is this, this uh, beautiful Sermon on the Mount, these kingdom, uh, kingdom living. And then we get to Matthew 10, with its, which is kingdom mission. And in the middle is kingdom-focused prayer. So this passage here ends with Jesus calling us 
to intercessory prayer for the workers to be sent out in the harvest, right? And that's actually the practical application that we're going to get to. But I want us to actually work backwards from that idea. I want us to actually see that the things that precede the call to pray impact the call to pray. The context here matters for what Jesus is calling us to do. Now, again, working backwards from that idea, we'll see how consistent prayer changes our hearts, gives us compassion, how it ultimately shapes us on a mission, because I don't see uh, any future for a Christian faith that is not filled with people who are praying for people far from God, for churches that are seeking the Lord to send out workers into the harvest. Now, I don't know the future of your church or really any church. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I work at a nonprofit organization. <laughs> but I want to say to you, and I don't want you to miss the beautiful reality that Jesus calls us to prayer, and consistent prayer builds compassion. Let's look at how. Number one, if you're taking notes, and I encourage you to follow along with us, and we provide you here at Harvest these uh, note sheets. You can kind of jot some things down and follow along with us. You'll actually retain more of God's word if you jot down some truths as we walk through the passage. But number one, consistent prayer is a result of the good news of the kingdom. Now, I said we were going to work our way backwards from the application, which is praying. But while we do so, we want to look at what Jesus says and points us to before that moment. Consistent prayer is a result of the good news of the kingdom. What is Jesus doing? Well, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, he tells us, the Bible says, uh, Matthew writes, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, Right and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Now, this is not just a statement of what Jesus is doing, but if you'll actually look, what you'll find is, is this is a consistent reset pattern in the gospel of Matthew. For example, if you look at Matthew chapter 4, it's not going to be on your screen, but Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, And he went throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. If you notice, that's remarkably similar to what Jesus says in Matthew 9, 35, even to the point where he says healing every disease and every affliction. Why? Because Matthew throughout the text will occasionally reset and start a new section. He's saying, all right, why is Jesus here? And then he moves forward with what's next. Now, what's remarkable and essential for us to understand here is that Jesus is about to transfer some of the role of his ministry to his disciples. So he's about to say, now up until this moment, his disciples had been recipients of his teaching, had been recipients of his ministry. Now he says to them, you're going to be, in Matthew 10, a few verses from our text, he says, now you're going to be participants in the ministry. So during that transition where now they'll be messengers of the gospel, we actually see Jesus say to them, well, he's going to eventually lead them to prayer. So again, Matthew 9.35 is a restatement of Jesus' ministry and ultimately a prayer, we're going to see in a minute, for us to join Jesus in that ministry. So this isn't uh, so much about doing and going, it's about praying because prayer, don't miss this, changes the heart and changes the situation. So prayer changes the heart and changes the situation. So, and this is why we pray 2,000 years after Jesus uttered these words in the midst of what we call the Lord's Prayer, but we might call the disciples' model prayer. Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So 2,000 years later, we still pray that prayer because we know the kingdom has come, but we've lost friends in, in Haiti this week. We know that people here today and at our campuses and, and Niles and Elgin and Rolling Meadows are sick and struggling or hurting financially. So we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I went back to the way I said it as a kid growing up outside of New York City, didn't I? Because Remember, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But here Jesus just didn't encourage us to pray alone, but instead he calls us to pray for people. He 
calls us to pray for laborers, we're going to see in a moment, in the harvest. And why? Because prayer drives us to action because it aligns our hearts with God's heart. Thy kingdom come, we would pray, so that our hearts might align with yours. So don't miss this, right? So we see when Jesus consists in prayer as a result of the good news of the kingdom, right? He goes and he proclaims and pronounces this throughout all the villages. It's a reset in the gospel of Matthew. Why? But prayer focuses you on kingdom values. Doesn't end there, right? So number, number two on our outline, you know, number one is consistent prayer is a result of the good news of the kingdom. But number two reminds us that consistent prayer gives us eyes to see the needs of the world around us. It's interesting how uh, Matthew describes uh, Jesus preaching and teaching. He resets, but then Jesus speaks and Matthew records. And here's what we see in just a moment. He kind of describes, right? It says, says, when he saw the crowds, what do we know Jesus does? How does he respond? Listen to what he says. When he saw the crowds, he, Matthew explains, he had compassion for them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because that word is so key, right? If you have, if you have your Bible, I encourage you, if you're, a, if you're a right in your Bible person, I, I want to encourage you to take just a moment and circle the word compassion in your Bible. In the original language, it's kind of a complex word that doesn't translate well actually into English. So circle that word compassion and put some exclamation points around it or or something to indicate that the the English word cannot fully describe the meaning in the original language. And why? Because it, well, sometimes the original language is even a little... um, The literal meaning might be a little confusing to us, right? It means to be moved in your inward parts, uh, literally to have your bowels um, moved. Now, that means something else to us today than its literal meaning of the word. That's not what is going on here. But the the bowels in the the Bible were often described as the seat of the emotion. Uh, It's the place where the deepest emotions are felt. And this word in the original language is to be moved in our inward parts, to be moved with compassion. Uh, Maybe Philippians 1.8 might reflect some of that where it says, I yearn for you with all affection. So it's not just compassion, but it's something that's gut-wrenching and heart-melting and aching heart for his people. Love that love that hurts and hurts deeply, right? Um, maybe you've had that at seasons of your life when, you're, when your kids were struggling or maybe when your spouse or your friend or a family member was going through something and there's nothing you could do. I remember that in my own life. So I have, uh, I have been married now for uh, coming up on 30 years to, uh, to Donna, who's uh, an amazing uh, wife and partner. And um, I, I remember we actually started dating in high school. We were high school sweethearts. We went to the, uh, the prom together, for example. Uh, we, uh, I, I tell people we started dating when we were 15. She says we started dating when we were 16. There's a year difference in our perception, which technically makes me a stalker for one year. Um, I thought we were dating. It appears she did not think we were dating, um, which is a little awkward, actually, when I found that out years later. Um, but so we got married, uh, and we got married at a young. We got married at, at 20, and, and in doing so, we, we subsequently, um, you know, we, we went off, started planting churches in the inner city of Buffalo, New York. I, I love Harvest Bible Fellowship's passion for church planting. I share it. So we, uh, we, we, we went off, and, and uh, eventually, there was, a, I won't give you all the details, but there came a time when Donna got, um, had a health issue that was very serious. That, that impact, that could impact our whole lives. And, and many of you have gone through this and worse than, than even we have. But, but I remember sitting one day, uh, knowing we couldn't get the answers from the doctors, knowing that it could be so bad, it could be life-threatening. And I know some of you have been much worse. But, but I remember sitting there and simply in the dark one night while she slept next to me and, and just was moved in the, in the inner being and just crushed and compassionate for my wife. And, and I, I just wanted something different for her and something better. And it, it felt like there was nothing that I could do. And, 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 and I had compassion for her because she was harassed and helpless. And maybe in that way, some way helps us understand the, the kind of compassion that, that Jesus speaks of. 
this deep-seated compassion for others that, that is not just described as simply when it says he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, which are strong words, by the way, harassed and helpless, speaking of even Jesus uh, seeing them as they were with, without and driven away and struggling and hurting like, like sheep with without a shepherd. It's a, it's, it's, it's a compassion that then Jesus is about to say, and don't miss this, you say, well, that's great that Jesus had that, so what does that have to do with us? Well, Matthew links all of these things together with prayer in, in just a moment. So you say, well, well, Ed, I mean, where, where does this, how does this connect together? How does Jesus shepherding, he's like sheep without a shepherd, how does this compassion, how does all this tie together? You got some verses that show that? I got some verses. Let's take a look. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he says in John 10, verse 11 through 15. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He, he also, right, he, he also, who is, he who is a hired hand and, and not a shepherd does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and, and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. But I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and they know me just as the Father knows and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is expressing this heart of the shepherd for the sheep who are driven and who are broken and who are hurting. Now don't miss this, right? He has the heart of a shepherd, but there's a link between prayer and compassion as a shepherd. This will be important in a minute, so watch this, don't miss this. But Jesus frequently prayed And coming back from prayer, he saw people searching for him, and he had compassion. Look at Matthew chapter 14. Here's what it says. It says, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. In those kinds of places, he would pray. But it says, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot on the towns. When he went ashore, there was a great crowd, and he had compassion. Same word, compassion on them. And he healed their sick. You see, prayer, don't miss this, prayer pushes you towards compassion. Compassion is so identifying with the needs of others that you must act. In Mark 6, 34, Jesus is again here. He says, so as he stepped ashore, he saw a huge crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began teaching them many things over And over again, we see prayer and compassion beautifully linked and compassion for those without. As I had the privilege of engaging the series that Pastor James has been walking us through, he started the series on why we don't pray. And in doing so, he did some um, research he shared in the first message. I'm sure you can go back and look at that online if you'd like. He said he did some research, which was, um, as best I can tell from what he described, was actually um, he talked to Kathy and his mom and some friends. Um, and he shared that with you as research. There's nothing wrong with that as someone who ran a research company for the last 10 years. Um, I'm not, I wasn't. So I, but I thought I should bring some research, maybe similar to him asking Kathy and his mom and some friends. Um, so I actually surveyed 4,000 Protestant churchgoers in English, Spanish, and French in the United States and Canada weighted them for ethnicity and region. And then, which is not as good as asking your mom, but let me show you some of the stats from the research. Let's take a look here. Let's take a look. You can see next to me, you can see here that um, we asked people who were Protestant church goers in the U.S. and Canada at Lifeway Research, a firm I ran until a few months ago. Uh, We asked them, I have a personal responsibility to share my religious beliefs about Jesus Christ with non-Christians. And as you can see, it's an encouraging, surprising maybe, 55% strongly agreed with that statement. Uh, 24% agreed somewhat. I think we'd find that most people who go to church regularly think that they should. They have a responsibility to share with people who are, who are not walking with Jesus, who, are not, uh, who don't have a shepherd in the sense that we do as Christians. Uh, we actually can look at another graphic here, right? I feel comfortable, I feel comfortable uh, that I can share these things with non-Christians, right? I feel comfortable I can share my belief in Jesus Christ with someone else effectively. I mean, that's, that's a little lower on the strongly agree, but the somewhat agrees are pretty strong. So we, we actually get to the place where that's 74. So three out of four people who regularly attend church uh, say that 
they could do this, that they could do this. Now, don't miss this, right? So what we've got is 70, when you put the two categories uh, on personal responsibility, we've got high 70s or mid 70s. High 70s say, uh, I, I should. Mid 70s say, I can. So let's see how they're doing. Here's a different study that we did, and we asked them um, among Protestant churchgoers, uh, how often have you shared with, in the past six months, how often have you shared with somebody personally how to become a Christian? Now, that's a pretty stunning kind of distance between the two stats, isn't it? We have an overwhelming sense, high 70s say I should, uh, mid 70s say that I know how, I feel comfortable. But the most common answer with in the last six months, not yesterday, not last week, but in the last six months, how many people have you shared how to become a Christian? The most common answer is zero. And, and 16% said one. And let me tell you something about surveys. People tend to exaggerate their answers. We have a technical word for that. We call it lying. Okay, that's not the technical answer. It's called the halo effect. But they tend, to, they tend to exaggerate their answers to make themselves look good. So my, I would guess is if we actually tracked them and asked them and, and followed around for six months, these numbers might actually be worse. You say, well, Ed, it's different here at Harvest, right? We're, we're, we're working hard in Elgin, and thank God for that. You know, we're, we're, we're inviting people in, in Niles, and, and we're working this in Rolling Meadows. And I want us to do that more, but the reality is, even if we asked if they invited people to church, let's take a look. Invited an unchurched person to attend a church service or some other program at your church. Don't miss this, right? The most common answer is zero. So for most people, they're not even inviting their friends who are unchurched to church. Now listen, I'm glad you invite your church friends to church. But I want us to invite our unchurched friends to church. People who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's my point. Why do we not share if we know how, if we think we should, why? I'm convinced that it's because, in part, we don't hurt for the lost. It's because we don't, or we're not moved with compassion as Jesus was. Our hearts do not break that all around us in this community and beyond, there are people who need Jesus. We've forgotten what it's like to feel and be lost. The whole world is lost without Jesus, and there's a whole lot of Christians who aren't trying to share the gospel with them. And I think a big part is if we think we should, and statistically we do, and and if we think we know how, and statistically we do, yet we're not, it tells us that there's something that has broken between our ability and our willingness, and prayer gives you the compassion that Jesus had for the harvest. So all around us, Rolling Meadows, Niles, Elgin, and wherever you're watching online, all around us, there are people that Jesus wants us to have a deep and abiding compassion for. And prayer brings us to that point. Now, mind you, that doesn't mean it's always easy, right? So, so uh, I, I, I just moved a couple of months ago here, as I mentioned, to Chicago. And, and I know about five years ago, I was burdened in my own neighborhood. And so, I, so I, I began to make a map of my own neighborhood to kind of explain a little bit about what was, uh, what was going on in my own neighborhood. And as I did, I, I kind of marked up a few things that would give us a... Uh, a picture of where I, I, I was and why this ultimately matters, right? So I live in here, so here's my house and, and kind of all around me were other people's houses and, 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 so, and, and on the street behind me were other people's houses and I am not an architect and I don't play one on television. <laughs> but I began to get a burden from the Lord that I needed to uh, pray for my neighbors and then share the gospel with my neighbors. I wanted to, to find the good news of the gospel, be new news to some of them. So I, so I began to share and I, I actually marked out um, some neighbors in our neighborhood and there were actually, actually eight families that I began to pray for and say, Lord, I want to be used of you. I want you to burden me for them. Not just to invite them to church, so that's good. I, I wanted to actually get with them and explain to them the good news of the gospel, to invite them to trust in Jesus by grace and through faith that Jesus died on the cross for their sin and in their place. And so over the course of a couple of years, we actually started a, started a Bible study here in our home. 
And we began to reach out to our neighbors. And I, I remember going to see these, these neighbors right here and, and, and having the privilege to share with them. We had a love for them. We had a compassion for them because we prayed for them. And as we prayed for them, God opened doors of opportunities for us to go to them. And then I had the privilege of sitting in their living room and, and praying with them to trust Christ as Lord and Savior and, and follow him. And then, and then to see them follow in baptism. And today he's a deacon in our church and she's a key leader in our church about three years later. Why? Because ultimately we needed a burden for our neighbors. We needed a compassion for those who didn't need Jesus, no, didn't know Jesus. I've had the privilege to be in all their houses except one. They don't like us. <laughs> you know, they don't like our kids. You know, they get off our lawn neighbors. Everyone needs to get off our lawn neighbor. You know, and that's, that's their ministry for our neighborhood. And, and uh, I didn't have the opportunity to share the gospel with them, but I did write about them in a book. But that's another story for another day. It's a chapter on turning the other cheek. But anyway, um, but I had the privilege, and I will tell you that, that, that I've had the privilege of actually sharing with a neighbor over here who's, who's, who's not yet a believer but is in and out of our church considering the claims of the gospel. I had the privilege of praying with the man in this family, and he's, he's now a follower of Jesus. And our, our church was too contemporary for him, and, and he grew up in another, another, in another continent where this kind of music was a bit rowdy. And so, but he prays God, he's going to a traditional church that's preaching the Bible, and he's growing. And I had the privilege of baptizing these folks who, who are now walking with the Lord, and they're actually missionaries in Brazil. And, and the Bible study that we led in our home, these, the, 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 she came and, and, and she, she, for reasons that she shared, she said she couldn't trust Jesus. But my heart is burdened for her still. And I just got a text from, from the family on the right side saying, you can come back. Our kids now have trusted the Lord. Will you, will you come back and baptize them? I said, sure I will. I'd love to do that. It's a church I planted there. But here's what I want you to see is I didn't get a burden to share the gospel with them until I started to pray for them. But when I started to pray for them, my inmost being was moved with compassion for them. And I had to tell them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the Bible says we're going to pray like that, it changes us. See, number three, consistent prayer exposes the need for a Savior. See, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38, we actually now get to the words of Jesus. Matthew's been explaining his motives. Jesus now gives his words. It says, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And don't miss this. What did I tell you earlier? Matthew 10, he basically says they're the laborers and they're going to go into the harvest. So Jesus is sort of like tricking them. No, he doesn't do that because he's the God of all the universe. But he's preparing them. Pray for the Lord of the harvest. And then just look, look what happens in the next chapter. The 12 apostles are sent out. But Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. If you've got, you got a pen, take a moment and circle the word laborers. Now, the word harvest is throughout this passage. Harvest is plentiful, right? Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. But the focus is to pray for the laborers. Why does that matter? Because the reality is people pray for a whole lot of stuff other than people coming to Jesus. Uh, Max Lucado published a book on prayer, I think it was last year, and he asked my research firm to uh, partner with him to do some research on prayer. And we asked Americans who pray, we serve them, do you pray? And if they say yes, we then followed up with a series of questions and we asked them, what do you, have you ever prayed for any of these things? Let's take a look at a few of these things that we asked them if they ever prayed for. Uh, have you ever prayed for people who mistreat you? 41%. Your enemies, 37%. We don't ask what they're praying for for those people. Have you prayed for winning the lottery? 21% said winning the lottery. Uh, have you ever prayed for uh, success in something you put no effort into? You're sleeping in the noon every day. Lord, bless me every way. <laughs> no one to find out about a bad thing you've done. 15%, Lord, I've done wrong. Don't let them find out. I love that one. God to avenge someone who hurt you or a loved one. Your favorite team to win a game, right? This is the year. For the cops. Yeah? How about that? You know, I mean, again, I don't know anything about sports, but I know this is the year for the cops. I've been watching. They, uh, they cinched the Stanley Cup, and they're going on to the Super Bowl. This is the year 
for the cups. Right? I'm excited about it. The curse of the goat has been broken by my goatee. So, so again, your favorite team. Bad things happen to a bad person. Finding a good parking spot. Not getting caught speeding. I prayed that on the way here tonight. But you, surely you prayed for a parking spot. Lord, help me find a parking spot. Now those are what Pastor James called arrow prayers just a few weeks ago. But remember the number 21% prayed for winning the lottery. I want you to remember that. Not so you can play that number. I'm not giving you the number to play. <laughs> but it's for a point in just a, a minute. Right? So, so, so what, what do people typically pray for instead? That's what we asked, have you ever prayed for? What do they typically pray for, right? So let, let's, let's not leave that, right? What do they typically pray for? Well, uh, 82% say they pray for family or friends or my own problems and difficulties or good things that have occurred or my own sin or people in natural disasters. Hope you've been praying for people in, 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 in Florida and the Carolinas and Haiti and Cuba and more. But I want you to notice the 20%. People of other faiths or no faith. Don't miss that, right? So 20% of people pray for people of other faith or no faith. Don't miss it, right? Because Jesus tells us to pray for workers in the harvest, but more people say they've prayed to win the lottery than normally pray to win the lost. 21% ever, 20% normally. So back to our passage. So what what does the Bible teach? It says, therefore, pray earnestly. Again, don't miss compassion, the depth of the compassion. And don't miss words like pray earnestly that speak of the depth of the passion of the prayer. Pray earnestly, Jesus says, that the laborers would go into the harvest. Pray earnestly. Now, don't miss this, right? Jesus tells them to do this, and then in the next chapter tells them it's them. So I don't want you to miss that as you hear the words of Jesus here. Now, don't miss. Now, not everything um, Jesus says to his disciples is for you. He tells sometimes his disciples to do things that he's not telling you to do. You say, what in the world? Pastor James, who'd you invite to preach here? Jesus tells a couple of disciples to go find a donkey. He has not told you to wander the streets looking for livestock. Um, But this is one of those things where it's obvious and evident that 2,000 years later, this applies to us. Why? Because you're to pray for workers in the harvest. And by the context, Matthew 10 says he's preparing his disciples to be the workers in the harvest. Sometimes the worker in the harvest is you. Because that's exactly what happened to the disciples. And remember the context here. This is the pivot point. This is the pivot point where they move from being those who receive Jesus' message to being those who tell Jesus' message. Remember, Matthew 9, this reset, he went about all the villages teaching and preaching, is the same as we saw in Matthew 4. It's a reset, and another section of Matthew is about to move forward. Now, why does this matter? Because the answer to this prayer is God's people, those who pray it, and others for whom are prayed. You know, I, I love um, your church. It's a remarkable church. Statistically, it's a mar- remarkable church. I, I keep a, I'm a research firm. You know, I have files on probably 10,000 churches in the United States. We have a special section for churches like yours. We call them freakishly abnormal. Um, but that's a good thing, right, for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, freakishly abnormal. And, and, and I love your, your pastor's incredibly gifted pastor and teacher, and thank God for that, right? That, that quality Bible teaching can make you smart for the gospel, can make you mature, in the scriptures, and I love that your pastor loves the gospel, but listen, I want also to remind us that people in our theological stream can talk about the gospel a lot in church, but if you talk about the gospel in church, but not to your neighbor, you've misunderstood the gospel. And prayer reshapes our thinking about our role. And so theologically minded churches are wonderful. This is the the stream in which I swim and I love and I value. But they can be like a bodybuilder who goes in and, and is constantly sort of working out the theology that's here. The depth of theology here is beautiful and God honoring and wonderful. And I'm blessed by it. But what I don't want you to do is to walk out into the world and look like you've missed leg day because we need missional legs too. So it's great to have the theological strength. It's essential to have the missiological passion. And Jesus links those things to prayer. 
The disciples are instructed to pray, and in the very next verse, to fulfill the prayer, right? So would it surprise you that Jesus would describe his disciples in ways that say, in Matthew 4, 19, Jesus speaks, and he said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. So it wouldn't surprise us that six chapters later, he'd tell them how. And he'd tell them that it matters. And people in Rolling Meadows and Niles and Elgin and Everywhere that's watching, they all around us need the gospel of Jesus Christ. This week, that was on my mind, probably a lot of ways, because but my father uh, lives in Jacksonville on a on a barrier island, um, and he uh, he texted me and and said, you know, we're evacuating. We're not sure we'll have anything left when we come back, and uh, and I, I said, Dad, I'll pray for you, and I try to say that a lot because see, my dad's not a he's not a Christian. When I say like he's not a Christian, I don't mean like he's another denomination. I mean, I mean he's not a follower of Jesus. And that's always burdened me to my innermost being. When I was, became a Christian as a young man, I came home to my dad, and I first thing I said to him is, Dad, uh, I said, are you saved? Because I was just saved. I learned the word. I didn't know it a week before. I knew it now. I just saved, and it was glorious that God saved me. And so I went home and said, Dad, are you saved? And he, and he said to be saved from what? And I said, I don't know, but you need it. And decades later, my dad still needs it. Last year, he called me up and he said, um, I'm going to have some surgery. I wanted you to know some surgery on my brain that actually um, I might not make it out alive. Now, obviously, you know he did because I just mentioned his current situation. Um, but he said, I might not make it out alive or I might lose a lot of my mental ability. And I said, Dad, and this was surgery was coming up next week. And I talked Wednesday. I said, Dad, can I come down and we just talk through some things. And he said, sure. So I, so I jumped on a plane. I bought a plane in a couple days' notice, and I, I jumped on a Southwest flight and flew down to Jacksonville, and I, I sat in his living room, and, I, and, and I, we had a ham sandwich together, and after the flight was factored, and it was the most expensive ham sandwich in the history of humanity. So I said, Dad, um, listen, you know why I'm here, and he did. And I said, you, Dad, you're about to go into a surgery. We don't know if you're going to come out. And I, we need to talk about where you are with Jesus. And he, and he explained to me that he's good. He, he, he kind of at peace with where he is and, and at peace with, you know, whatever's out there. And I said, Dad, and we walked through and we talked for three hours. And I will tell you, it is very nerve-wracking to share the faith with your dad. He's, uh, he knows your sin and you're stupid. In fact, he's found some of your sin and your stupid over the years. And so I'm sitting there and I'm saying, Dad, and why would I do this? Why would I jump on a plane? Why would I make myself uncomfortable? For three hours we talked together and we laughed and we cried and he let me pray for him and we laughed and cried some more. Let me pray for him again. And, and I will tell you why. Because I know that without Christ, my dad slips into a Christless eternity if this surgery goes badly or if five years from now he dies. And I know that my compassion runs deep for him. But I know Jesus' compassion runs deep for my neighbor and my coworker and my family member, and I want to live my life, and I want you to live your life in such a way that prayer has changed your priorities, and people who need Jesus are now on your radar screen. And I thank God that we've been carrying around, and I've been joining with you in praying. I thank God we're carrying around these prayer cards. But if there's no people on this prayer card, then perhaps the gospel has not rightly rooted in the compassion of your heart. And it's not too late to take it out and say, I want to pray for my aunt or my brother, or my neighbor, or my coworker. Now what's fascinating about this is the very Jesus who said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, is the same Jesus who in John 20, 21 said that he was living on a sent mission, right? 40 times in the gospel of John, Jesus says, I've been sent by my father in some way. The father has sent me, I've been sent by my father. At the end of the Gospel of John, in John chapter 20, verse 21, he then says, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Don't miss that. Jesus, speaking to his disciples then, 2,000 years speaking to his disciples now, says, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. So my question for you is, how are we doing as those whose prayer has shaped their compassion, whose compassion has sent them on a mission, and now who can say, yes, Lord, here I am, send me. Here's the wonderful thing. We, the rest of the survey was pretty fascinating. We asked among Americans who pray if their prayers were answered. 
And uh, 25% of them say that their prayers are answered, all of them. All of them. Which is pretty cool. Um, 21% say most of them. 37% say some of them. There's a whole theological discussion we could have here. As, as God answers prayers, somebody says no. What is that? You know, there's a whole theological discussion that we can have here. But I, I want you to pray some prayers that I can absolutely guarantee that God will answer, um, with, without exception, okay? Here, here's, here's why. Because if you pray this prayer that Jesus actually told you to pray, let's, let's, let's look at it again, right? Let's look down. Therefore, pray earnestly. Maybe I'm gonna line those two words, right? Pray earnestly. Look down in your Bible. Pray earnestly earnestly. Make sure you put a circle around earnestly. This is not just a little bit of prayer. This is the kind of interceding prayer, the kind of beseeching the Lord that Pastor James has been talking about. Pray earnestly. And what for what? Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. So God is sovereign over all, right? The work of new life in Christ is Christ's work as he brings people to new life in him, as he transfers people from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son, right? So it's God's work. So pray to the Lord of the harvest that he, that's gonna be his job, right? That he, Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers and the harvest. Say, Ed, how can you guarantee this prayer will be answered? Because of the context of the passage. Because after Jesus tells them to pray, he tells them they're part of the answer in Matthew chapter 10. Now, um, God desires for us to be people of prayer. And I have to be transparent with you. Um, first of all, I, I just was really blessed by uh, Pastor James' transparency. Um, because he, in the first message, said pretty much, I got to work on this too. I don't know about you, but I love the fact that your pastor can get up before you and tell you, I got to work on this too, that, that this series is in part how the Lord is working in his life. Well, you also know that Pastor James and our friends, and so having the privilege to uh, watch him say that, I'm also encouraged to say before you that I, I'm not a naturally inclined person towards prayer. As a matter of fact, I'm a little bitter at people who are, just to be perfectly honest. You know, my wife is that way. She's a, she's a, she's an introvert. Um, I, uh, matter of fact, all of our family is an introvert except her. So on Mother's Day, we just go away and leave her alone, and uh, we bless her with silence for a while. All three of my daughters, all extroverts, right? Um, so my wife is just a deep person of abiding prayer. She, um, she, she, she opened. That's why that's why I fell in love with her as as a 15 year old when we started the date. Uh, but. I'm a little jealous sometimes because my mind races about. Um, I, I, I find myself, there's much to do, and I hear the stories of people say there's a lot to do, so I better spend an extra two hours in prayer, and I think I want to be like that person. And, and here's the thing, the picture that we see in the scriptures of abiding prayer, the examples that Pastor James has put before us of people are abiding prayer, they're actually not that much different than us. But they have chosen to abide in prayer. And so I, I want to ask you to do that even here. By the way, and if you don't know any lost people, you write down the name Ed Stetzer and you pray for my dad. Because he needs Jesus. But I bet you know some people who need Jesus too. So I want to be among those who consistently see answered prayer and God answers the prayer for laborers because in part he offers, he answers it through us. And prayer is the means by which God is working in his people and prayer, don't want you to miss this, when you live this way, when you see prayer as the vehicle that drives people to the mission of God, then prayer helps you put your yes on the table. Lord, I'm praying for my neighbor. And I remember that, I mean, some of these were scary people, Right? I need to live in a better neighborhood, I guess. And this couple here, they, uh, they came over to my house after I first went over to share with them and they rang the doorbell. I was working out. I know what you're thinking, you're doing that wrong. Um, <laughs> but I was working out and they came and they rang the doorbell. I came up all sweaty and messy and they said, oh, we'll come back another time. I said, no, don't come back another time. 
I, I didn't want to say them. I've been praying for you, and, and why are you all here? It was the mother, the stepfather, and the son. They're all here together. And I said, come on in. What's up? And they sat down and said, the last time you were over, we had some questions. We're kind of unsure what you meant, that Jesus died for us, and by grace we receive him. Explain to us. We wrote that down, and we want to understand. And so sitting there, kind of in a sweaty day, uh, and interrupting my routine, and I desperately need exercise... I sat with them, and we walked through what the gospel meant. Now, I want you to know where that started. That started when I started to pray for them two years before. See, prayer is putting your heart on the table and letting God put it on the map. He'll send you to that place that he calls you to go. So take that prayer card and ask, is there anyone, anyone, any person on that list because prayer focuses you on the mission of God to people for whom he has deep compassion and he calls you to have deep compassion. So I don't know about you, but I just never got over that Jesus saved me and that he wants to save a whole lot more people. And I get to be privileged to pray for laborers in the harvest and then to be among those laborers in the harvest. So don't miss as we walk in through this series and as we continue our breakthrough prayer series, I don't want you to miss how God is speaking, right? As Pastor James laid out before us, why we don't pray, challenging us. And then how biblical prayer brings, builds confidence and confident prayer builds persistent. But I want you not to miss that consistent prayer builds compassion. I want your heart to break for people in Elgin and Niles and Rolling Meadows like Jesus' heart breaks, heart breaks for them. So would you take just a moment and pray with me? Can we ask the Lord to burden us? Can we pray what he told us to pray? I mean, let's not talk about pray. Let's pray and let's pray what he told us to pray and then let's be the answers to the prayer he told us to pray. Pray with me. Father, by your grace and your goodness, we acknowledge that you've redeemed us and called us by name. And Father, we're burdened for lostness. And if we're not, burden us for lostness. We thank you for theological depth and biblical richness, Father. But I pray you give us a compassion for people who don't know Jesus. Just with your head bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment. Right now, could you ask the Lord to burden you in your innermost being to have the compassion like he had for those who were like sheep without a shepherd, harassed and run about without Jesus? Just right now, just ask him. Say, Lord, wherever you are, if you're watching online, whatever camps you are, say, Lord, Burden me for people without Jesus. Let's pray like he told us to pray. Would you do that? Just say, Lord Jesus, pray with me. Say it out loud. Lord Jesus, send workers to the harvest. Say it. Send workers to the harvest. Say it again. Send workers to the harvest. Lord Jesus, in your goodness, you've saved us. In your goodness, would you use us as the means to spread the message of how you might save others. Could you just for a moment, I, I mentioned two times this card, my breakthrough prayer card. If there's not a name on there, would you ask you right now the Lord to burden you for a name? If you don't have a name, use my dad. But I bet you have a name. Father, I pray right now you speak to people and in Elgin about who they're to they're, they're reach out to and to begin to pray for, for Niles or Rolling Meadows Online, wherever they are, to say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to pray for this person. I'm going to be burdened for this lost person. I'm going to have my innermost being burnt, burned with compassion for them. And I'm going to pray, Lord, for laborers to, to go to them from other people, but for me to be one of those laborers. Jesus. We want to be obedient to you and be people of deep and abiding breakthrough prayer. May you, Lord, by your grace and your goodness, prompt us to be a people of mission because we were a people of prayer. So that your name and your fame would be more widely known in our communities and around the world. Lord, send laborers in the harvest and may we be among them. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen.